So unity, huh? There's no way this could be touchy at all. Uh, let's talk about this topic. We are in the fourth week of our series, Lessons from the Last Supper, and this whole series we've been looking specifically at a, a few chapters in the Gospel of John, John 13 through 17, where we see Jesus sharing this last meal, this last supper, uh, with his disciples before he is crucified. And so this is essentially his last extended period of time to be able to teach them uh, before he dies, rises again, and, and ascends. So this is a really important time for him. And as we've seen over these four weeks, these ideas that he conveys to them during this last supper are, are what are most important to him. They're, they're deeply on his heart. Um, but one of the things that has made this series kind of unique is because we've stuck just in the Gospel of John, we can take into account some of the reasons why the entire book was written in the first place. And if you remember from the first week when we talked about this, John wrote the, wrote the Gospel uh, likely at the end of his life, towards the end of his ministry and his life. So in some sense, uh, what he was doing was to pass on this, this Gospel as a legacy for the early church. Now. People talk about what Jesus teaches here. Sometimes they refer to it as a, his farewell discourse. Um, so I would argue that even as this is, this is Jesus' farewell discourse for the disciples, the entire gospel is John's farewell discourse to the church. And, and like I said in week one, this is why this matters. The reason is because we are the church, right? We, we are the church today. So when we read these words of Jesus, they are not just words meant for his disciples, their words meant for us. And there are going to be a lot of things that we see even today that are not just written for them, but are written for us. So um, let me give you a quick little recap in case you missed one or two of the weeks of this series of where we've been. The first week, I set up the book uh, and, and this whole series and then talked about the provocative act that Jesus began by washing his disciples' feet. Before he even began teaching, he did something which just blew them away and shocked them. He explained the radical love that they are to have for one another. The second week, uh, we talked about Jesus' promise that the Holy Spirit would come, the, the advocate that, uh, who would guide us into all truth. And then last week, we talked about Jesus' teaching that he was the true vine and how abiding, how remaining in him is crucial to keeping our faith alive. So that was the series so far, and today we're going to look at how Jesus ends this, this Last Supper with his disciples, and he ends it with prayer. He prays for his disciples, and it's a prayer specifically for unity, for unity. So um, now th this is a prayer, so you might think, oh, they just happened to overhear this prayer, but I think that even, even though this is a prayer and he's making actual requests to God, this is a real prayer, I also think that, that this is a lesson for his disciples as well, because he's doing it in their presence, he's standing up, potentially standing in front of them, they're all hearing it. I think what he was praying, as much as, a, as it was a prayer, I think he was also trying to convey something that he didn't want them to forget. And I think you'll see why in just a second. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at John 17. So go ahead and grab a Bible. I would love it if you had a Bible in front of you, whether the app or, or one of our house Bibles or your own Bible. If it's a house Bible, it'll be page 898. Uh, if you want to use the app, you can do that as well. But please keep it open for as much of the sermon as you, as you can, because we're going to be going uh, and looking at a few different verses uh, throughout. And I'd love for you to be able to see how this all fits in context. Uh, so John 17 is where he essentially comes to the end of this Last Supper. And if you remember, uh, the disciples are kind of terrified at this point. Uh, he's, Jesus has been seeking to comfort them and to, to teach them and guide them because they don't really know what's coming next. They, they have some vague sense that something terrible is about to happen. Jesus has been talking about death a lot. They're like not really sure. Um, but beyond that even, they have no clue what to expect. But Jesus does. He knows what's coming next. And so this is what happens at the very end. So let's read this, uh, John 17, verse 1. After saying all of these things, all of the, the farewell discourse, Jesus looked up to heaven and he said this, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory that we shared before the world began. 
Okay, so Jesus kicks off this prayer with some pretty heavy stuff. And frankly, we could probably do an entire sermon just on that little paragraph that we just read because there's a lot of concepts in there that aren't exactly easy to follow. He talks about authority. He talks about eternal life. He talks about uh, uh, glory, like this whole concept of glory. And it, so it's theologically dense. Uh, but essentially, I'll just boil it all down. This is essentially what it means. He's essentially saying, look, I am the son of God. I'm the Messiah. I am who I say I am. I'm the real deal. He's setting that up because what he's about to say, what he's about to pray for the rest of this prayer, it's not to be taken lightly, okay? He is who he says he is. Now, the whole prayer is a little bit too long for us to go into in detail. So essentially what comes next, he begins to pray for his disciples and he spends the rest of this prayer praying that they would be, uh, that they would be uh, unified, which we'll get to in a second. But he also prays um, that they would be protected, that they would become holy, that they would be guided into the truth. He prays all that for them. Um, and then he prays what I think is sort of the heart of the prayer, which we'll look at now, um, starting in verse 20. And this is the point in which Jesus begins to pray for you and for me and for everybody who was going to come after these disciples. This is a prayer for us and not just the people in that room. So let's read this, verse 20. Jesus says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I've given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want the, these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. But I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. Wow. Okay, this is how he ends, and after this, it begins this long uh, sequence that leads to his crucifixion. So this is how the Last Supper ends. This prayer right here, like I said before, is a prayer for the entire church. It's a prayer for all of us. Look, look again at verse 20. For these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That includes us. That includes Grace Church. That includes Grace Church. And the focus of this whole prayer, like I said, is unity. It's a single concept, unity. Now, there are a couple of ideas along with this in this prayer that's very dense that we need to kind of tease apart. The first of them is, is the kind of unity that Jesus is referring to here. Um, it gets a little bit confusing because look at what he says in verse 21. This is not just some kind of peaceful coexistence. Uh, this is what he says. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. Okay, Jesus is praying, get this, that our unity with each other would be just like the unity between him and his father. What does that look like? What does that even look like? Honestly, this is hard to grasp. And I'm not just saying for like people who haven't read the Bible a lot. I mean like for humans. This is hard for us to get our mind around. If you look at the whole arc of scripture, what you see is this concept of, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit existing in this kind of dance, this dance of radical self-giving love, each one sort of giving way before the others. And it's this, 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 self, this radical self-giving love that somehow defines their existence as God. And I'm not... I'm not supposing that anybody in here fully grasps the concept of the Trinity. It's really, really hard to get our minds around, but that is the kind of thing that he's talking about. If you go back at verse five, he says that, that the love that, that he and his, the, his father shared existed before the world began. This is eternal and it's, and it's incredible. Somehow, somehow, our unity, the unity that we have for one another as followers of Christ should resemble the unity that exists within the Trinity. Okay, now we can chew on that one for a while, but I want to just move beyond that just a little bit and tease out this other issue that we have to talk about. And that's the outcome, the outcome of this unity. What would it look like, according to Christ, if we actually were one? 
if we were unified. To, to learn this, look at verse 21. He says, and may they be in us, why? So, the, so that the world will believe you sent me. And verse 23, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Okay, somehow Jesus is connecting the dots between the unity that we display and the legitimacy of his message. Think about that. The unity that we display and the legitimacy of his message. When we're unified, he says, the world will believe that Jesus came from God, that he is who he says he is when we're one. Well, it's not a real stretch to, to say that perhaps the, the opposite is also true. If the church is not unified, if we are not one, well, then the world is not going to believe our message. The message of Christ is, is illegitimate. Yikes. Yikes. I mean, no pressure, right? We've got to be unified like that? Here, essentially, this is what the passage is saying. If I could just boil this all down, essentially, this is what the takeaway is, and it's not an easy takeaway, but it's this. If we want the world to know Jesus, we must be unified like never before. That's what it comes down to. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about what this means for us and what this looks like. Uh, how, do, how have we done with this over the years? We'll start with the early church. The disciples that were in the room when Jesus prayed this, they went on to become apostles. They went out and they started churches and they built congregations and they trained up disciples of their own. How did they do in the whole unity department? Well, the other day, just out of curiosity, I decided to kind of just start flipping through some of the New Testament. I mean, I wasn't doing like a, a category search or a word search or anything. I was just idly flipping through just to see if any verses about unity popped out at me. And no joke, I want to, I want to read you some of the verses that popped out at me. And I started, I almost like started chuckling because they were in every single book that I looked at. Okay, listen to some of these from different, different authors. And every one of these verses is from a different book in the New Testament. Uh, in 1 John, John says, Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. And Peter said, All of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. And then Paul says, make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Another verse says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Or how about this one? Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. We've all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share that same spirit. And then the classic verse, which many of you have probably heard, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, you get the point, right? Holy cow, over and over and over and over again, this same topic comes back up again and again. This is a major theme in the New Testament. You could spend months just studying unity in the New Testament. Okay, so what does this tell us? What does this tell us? Well, I think it tells us two pretty obvious things, if we really think about it. The first one, this was a big deal to the, to the apostles, right? They, they kept writing about it because this was important to them. I think that, that unity in the church to them was not some kind of side issue. This wasn't some secondary thing to deal with when they, when they felt like it. No, this was something fundamental about what the church was meant to be. I think when Jesus was praying for these disciples at that Last Supper, they heard him loud and clear, and they understood that this was crucial. So, okay, obviously this was important to them. But secondly, what else can we, can we gather? What else can we surmise from the fact that it's brought up again and again and again? Well, they probably weren't doing such a good job at it, were they? If these guys had to keep writing about this again and again, I mean, the early church struggled with this. This was not an easy topic for them. And it's not really hard to figure out why. When you read through these letters and you look a little bit more deeply, all you see are, are churches that were people divided uh, along theological lines, along ethnic lines, along economic lines, along gender lines, again and again, one division after another. But these apostles understood that this could not be. This couldn't be how it is. The stakes were too high. 
According to Jesus in John 17, the love and the unity that his disciples had for one another is what would show the world that Jesus was who he says he was. He told him this flat out in John 13, 35, earlier on in the Last Supper. He said, your love for one another, that will prove to the world that you're my disciples. And then in 1721, which we just read, he prayed that they would be unified so that the world will believe that God sent him. The church's unity is what would show the world that Jesus came from God, that he really was the Messiah. In other words, it's not our preaching. It's not our our buildings. It's not our really effective programs that does it. It's not our politics or our power. It's our unity our unity. Without that, without being one, our gospel message just doesn't hold much water, does it? This is why we see the idea over and over and over again in the New Testament. The stakes for the church's unity are really, really high. It should be a top priority for the body of Christ. So, you with me so far? So this is a big deal. This is a huge issue, and it was a big one for the early church to deal with. So how are we doing today? How are we doing in in the modern day? We've had 2,000 years of of time to figure this out, right? Have we been doing really well in our whole unification efforts? Yeah, (laughs) I, I, I hear that no. I hear that no. Yeah, not so well. Not so well. For a couple of reasons. Let's start first. Let's talk about denominations. Um, if you're not familiar, denominations are just different groups of Christians who have decided to um, to identify themselves around certain ideology or theology or practices that make them distinct from other denominations. Some of them are pretty hardcore about it. They think they're the only ones with the truth, and everybody else is is not saved. Um, some of them are way more open, and they say, "No, this is just some of the practices that define us." And so there's a whole range of them. But frankly, there's a lot of denominations in the world. Uh, it started with some of the big ones. There's like the Roman Catholics. They don't, they don't agree with the Eastern Orthodox Christians. And then uh, the Protestant church doesn't agree with either of them, and they don't agree with the Protestants. And then you've got the Protestants themselves who don't even agree with themselves. <laughs> you've got hundreds and hundreds of Protestant denominations all over the map theologically. Um, just for kicks, as I was preparing for the sermon, I googled uh, church, church denomination graph or a chart or something like that just to see what would come up, and I've got to show you some of the things I found. Uh, this first one right here, okay, someone very gifted in graphic design, clearly, but uh, this, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear. You can kind of make it out, but look at this next one. This one uh, makes it a little more pretty, and that is just clear as mud. There's the, how the denominations came to be, and this last one cracks me up. Look at this one. Okay, here we go. <laughs> That is, that is how you can follow the church denomination. I mean, it's, it's nuts, right? We are one as, as Christ and the Father are one. Can't you tell? Yeah. Yeah, maybe not so much. Maybe not so much. But beyond just theology, beyond, beyond just our, our denominational differences, I think you guys, have, you're feeling what I'm feeling in the church right now, which is that there are some deep divisions creeping in. No, they're not creeping in. They're already here in the American church. We all feel them. These are the kinds of divisions that actually cut maybe even between you and the person sitting next to you. These sorts of divisions are here. They're a part of our life now as modern American people. Our culture is herding, H-E-R-D-I-N-G, herding. We're like, we're like herds of, of cattle or sheep who have clumped together around different uh, ideologies or identities or uh, people with like-minded ideals who are putting up emotional barriers to protect themselves from everybody else. We're herding. And social media and all of that doesn't really help at all, does it? It's so much easier to find people who think exactly like us and we keep everybody else at arm's length. And this herding mindset has, has crept into the church. It's here. Republican, Democrat, rich, poor, middle class, pro-life, pro-choice, conservative, liberal, feminist, nationalist, social justice warrior, gun rights advocate, snowflakes, America first, black lives matter, make America great again, gay marriage, build the wall. Now some of those perfectly harmless opinions, and some of them, As we've seen in our nation recently, some of them have a tendency to rip communities and families apart at the seams. And the same thing is true for the church. 
Let me ask you this. Where does our primary identity lie? Where does our primary identity lie? Is it in our, our, our lifestyle? Is it in our, our ideology, in our politics? Or does our primary identity lie in the fact that we are followers of Christ, that we are a part of the church? Is that who we are at our core? Now, this is difficult stuff to chew on. This is hard to, to think about. Uh, because you know what? Over the last several years, I have heard more and more people, and I, I'm guilty of this too, I've said it myself, saying things like, I don't want to be associated with those Christians. Right? You've heard that phrase before. I don't want to look like that. I don't want those people to have the same label that I do. They're not a part of my herd. We've said that. And, and sure, sometimes it's perfectly reasonable when you're talking about saying, like, I don't want people to think that I'm like the Westboro Baptist people extreme, that their, their way of life doesn't even reflect the gospel. It, that makes a little bit more sense. But here's what breaks my heart the most. I've heard grace people say the same thing about other grace people. That cannot be. That cannot be. Jesus prayed that his disciples would be unified, that they would be one. If we can't be unified here as Grace Church, then why would anybody believe our message about Jesus? Why would they? Look back at verse 23. I want to I take this and I just want to make it really personal for us. I'm going to change a few words and make it about us. Verse 23. May Grace Church experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love Grace Church as much as you love me. Are we unified? Are we one? Because the truth is this. If we want the world to know Jesus, and we do, then we must be unified like never before, especially now, especially in this time. So, okay, what do we do? How do we, how do we move forward? Is this hopeless? Is this hopeless because, you know what, it's taken 2,000 years and it doesn't seem to be look, it doesn't look like we've made much progress in this area. Is this hopeless? Well, I don't think it is. I don't think it's hopeless. I think it's hard. I think it's challenging, but I don't think it's hopeless. And here's why I think that. Because we have clues right here in the Last Supper that will give us the tools we need to begin finding our unity. Right in these same verses that we've been looking at for the last three weeks, we are going to find answers there. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons I'm so grateful that we have the scriptures handed down to us from generation to generation because this, these are the words of truth that can help us find our way when we are so lost around issues like this. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go back and we're going to look at what we've already covered in this series and see if we can find answers that help us understand how to find unity. And let me give you a hint on, how, on why I think this is going to work. Because throughout this whole Last Supper farewell discourse of Jesus, these are not just random ideas that Jesus was like, oh, and I forgot, what about this one and this one? No, this is a, a unified whole. It's cohesive. When Jesus was teaching about all the things he covers on this Last Supper, it's all painting a picture of what it means to be a follower of Christ. He's painting a picture of what our life should look like. And I believe that unity is a natural outcome of living that way. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, look, look back at uh, chapter 15. If you could turn back to chapter 15, what we looked at last week. In this chapter, Jesus is using the image of a grapevine um, to describe what our relationship could look like or should look like with him. Verse five, look at verse five of, of chapter 15. Jesus says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain abide in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Remember last week's sermon, the, the big takeaway from last week's sermon? Remain, 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 remain. That was the, the big takeaway. I think we can remember that if you were here. Our first job, our, our, our crucial first job is to abide, to remain in Christ, to be grafted in to the true vine. 
Here's the thing. This grafting, this, this is a conscious choice. It's a conscious choice because it requires setting aside all other identities. Think about this. How often do we choose to graft ourselves into the vine of a political party? Or, or to graft ourselves into the vine of a, of a social identity or, or one side or the other of some hot button issue? How often do we herd into an identity other than that of Christ? How often does that happen? The fruit that we bear reflects the vine that we choose. And if we want Christ-like unity in this church, we have to make him our vine. Him alone. So that's step number one. Abide in Christ. Step number two has to do with our advocate, the Holy Spirit. So turn back another chapter, back to chapter 14, and look at what Jesus says in verse 16 of that chapter. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit, who what? Who leads you into all truth. Who leads into all truth. This is the good news, guys. We are not alone in our quest for unity. We also have an advocate living within us, eager, eager to guide us and to help us with this. And this is huge right now in this era where we've got so many different voices all trying to guide us into their version of the truth, right? Politicians and, and celebrities and YouTubers, all these people who are, who are so eager for us to understand their truth, to lead us into their truth. But the reality is far too often the truth that they offer it doesn't unite people, it divides them. Human wisdom, human wisdom will never be enough, will never be enough for us to figure out this unity thing. We must rely only on our advocate, the Holy Spirit, to guide us into the truth. He's the one with the truth and we need his guidance, right? If we want this church to be unified, we must listen to the advocate who unites us all. So, we must abide in Christ. We must rely on the Holy Spirit's truth. And now the easiest one of all, <laughs> I'm joking, we must wash each other's feet. Yeah. Yeah, not so easy after all. If you remember that first week of this series, there were a lot of people wrestling, including myself, because this is not an easy thing to swallow. It's not an easy pill to swallow. If you remember... Uh, when we started this series, we looked at this provocative and shocking act that Jesus did. The Son of God, the Messiah, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and then washed the feet of all of his disciples. These grimy, nasty feet, he did that for them out of love. If we want the message of Christ to be heard in this noisy world, we cannot just exist serving the people around us who deserve it. Remember, Jesus washed the feet of Judas. He washed the feet of Judas. Now, we must die to ourselves. We must die. We must carry our cross and serve each other daily. That's how it has to happen. Jesus prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. And this is what he's talking about. We are being invited to join the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in their dance of radical self-giving love. We're being, being invited to join them in, in, in a race to the bottom, to, to set aside our dignity and our authority and to set aside all the things that we find make us so happy and proud of ourselves, to set those things aside and to serve as servants and slaves of those around us. It's a race to the bottom. If we want unity at Grace Church, we must set aside our dignity and wash each other's feet. Not because it's fun, not because it's easy, but because the very message of Christ depends on it. It's a race to the bottom. I've said this already several times, I'm gonna say it again. If we want the world to know Jesus, we must be unified like never before. There is a net around the American church right now, but it is not a net of immorality. It's not a net of, of uh, theology. It's a net of irrelevancy. 
Christ has the, the life that our world needs, and people are dying without him. But when, when our church, when the American church, when Grace Church lives in disunity, when we let hatred and division come between us, the very message of life that Christ brings is being discredited. That's the reality that we're facing right now. But imagine what would happen if we turned that around. Imagine if we, if we were in a race to the bottom. Imagine if we swam down together. We could start to serve each other with the radical self-giving love of washing each other's feet. We could be dialed in and tuned into the voice of the Holy Spirit, guiding us into truth. We could abide in Christ. We could be grafted into the true vine and set aside every other identity that we have in our life. That could be true for us. And in this time of division and hatred and conflict, we would shine so brightly with the love of Christ for our world. We could be one, guys. We could be the church. We could fulfill the prayer of Jesus thousands of years ago and become one. Swim down. You pray with me. Father, this is not easy for us. Our tendency is to retreat to those who think like we do, to, uh, to herd, to, uh, to gather ourselves into these clumps of people that, that hold everyone else at arm's length. And Father, I know, we know, that that is not your heart for the church. You want us to be unified. You want us to be one. And so God, I pray now as we look ahead into this next era of Christendom, as we think about what the future of the church might look like, I pray that you would give us the courage to believe that we can be one, that it is not hopeless. But Father, that your spirit will guide us into the truth and you will help us become the church that you've dreamt of us to be. So Father, I pray that you would give us the humility to set aside our identities, to set aside the things that we've identified ourselves as and all of the identities that we have that are apart from yours, that we would set them aside and hold tightly only to our identity identity as your sons and daughters. Father, we need your help in this time because there's this net closing around us and I don't want this church to be irrelevant. Give us the strength we need to march forward as one And with one voice say that you love the world and that you want to bring everyone back into relationship with yourself. Give us that strength, Father, and give us that humility. We need your help. So, Father, I pray all of these things in the the powerful and matchless name of your son, Jesus. Amen.